Hi everyone. In this video we're going to go through a couple of examples that I often use at conferences while giving talks or giving demonstrations to you know, people at the floor, uh, or what I give inside of sales calls when I talk to other companies. Uh, the goal here is to help both you know, Continuum sales engineers uh, and also other people who just want to talk about Dask inside their company and give them sort of an example of sort of what I usually talk about, how I present it, uh, and how to use these examples. Uh, I'll talk through two examples, a high level and a low level example, and I'll go through a couple of questions that often come up afterwards. Um, so all the materials I'm giving here uh, are actually all available, and the cluster is all available at uh, with the Dask EC2 project. So if you sort of follow the instructions there, you'll get a cluster that has everything set up exactly as I have it here, uh, including these notebooks. Okay, so uh, Dask has a low level task scheduler, which executes Python functions on a cluster. Uh, and that's a little bit complex to get, dive into at first. Uh, before what I, what I usually do is I start with Dask data frames, which are built on top of Dask, and are just sort of one sub-module, but it's usually pretty intuitive for people. So we're going to start with example with Dask data frames, and we're sort of dive a little bit deeper uh, into something called Dask delayed. And that ends up being actually more useful for a lot of companies, um, but it's sort of good to see one and then the other. So to start out with, uh, I'm going to connect to uh, S3, and look at I have some data uh, sitting up there. Uh, this is the New York City Taxi Cab data set. It's every cab ride in the city of New York for the year 2015. It's stored as CSV files, as 12 CSV files. Uh, I can read a little bit of it here with pandas. I'm just reading five rows because I couldn't read all the data because it's too big to fit in memory on one machine. Uh, and you can see here the data is, you know, when the ride happened, how many passengers were in the cab, you know, where it picked up and dropped off, uh, and a breakdown of the fare, you know, how much was the tip, etc. So as I said, I was that it was too large to fit comfortably in the memory of one machine, but fortunately I happened to have uh, eight machines nearby. Uh, each machine has eight cores. So what we're going to do is we're going to use not the pandas read CSV function, but the dask data frame read CSV function, which has actually the exact same interface as the pandas read CSV function. And so what this is doing is this is uh, breaking up those 12 CSV files into around 300 different blocks of bytes. So you know, each CSV file is maybe 20 gigabytes. Every block of bytes is every block of block of bytes is maybe 128 megabytes. Um, and what we're seeing here on the right is we're seeing uh, the activity of each of the cores in our cluster. So there's 64 lines here, one for each uh, core, and every core is reading some blocks of bytes from S3, and that's blue and then it's uh, parsing those bytes into a pandas data frame using the normal pandas read CSV function. And so what we're getting here is we're getting you know, across our eight machines, which all have their own memory, uh, there's hundreds of pandas data frames that we're loading into memory spread across all of those machines. And what a Dask data frame does is a Dask data frame coordinates all of those pandas data frames uh, with one sort of user level abstraction. So a Dask data frame is just a logical coordination of many pandas data frames. Uh, it looks and feels a lot like a pandas data frame. It's, it satisfies a subset of the API. Um, so if you notice here, we'll see we'll compute the head of that data frame and it will look and feel very much like a pandas data frame. It prints just the same, it has the same data in it. Um, you know, it, it is literally just a bunch of pandas data frames. And so everything we're doing here sort of operates at pandas speeds, uh, with nice pandas responsiveness. Uh, so as an example here, let's look at how we might compute the length of a data frame. So we computed the length here in our notebook, and what that did is that told our cluster to compute the lengths of each of our 300 constituent data frames, and those lengths might have taken, you know, uh, a few microseconds or something like that. And then we communicated all of those uh, intermediate lengths to one machine, and we computed the sum. So this is a simple way that we might compute the length of a full data frame by computing lengths on all the intermediate data frames. And we find that there are about 150 million rows in this data set. Got our answer back in around 194 milliseconds. So computing the length is pretty simple. Uh, it's not a very complex operation. Let's do something a little bit more complex. Uh, let's, um, let's find how well New Yorkers tip. So we're going to remove some bad rows. So rows where the tip was zero, where the fare was zero, there's some odd free rides in New York City. Um, we're gonna make a new column, which is the tip fraction. Um, and let's actually just use more native pandas syntax for this. Uh, so if there's someone that you're talking to who knows pandas, all of this should look pretty familiar to them. Uh, it is, it's normal pandas syntax. Um, 
Um, and then we're going to we're going to make a new a new column, which is tip fraction, which is the ratio of the tip amount to the fair amount. Sort of you know it's a ten percent tip, it's a twenty percent tip. And group by the hour of the day and the day of the week. And pandas has a lot, a lot of nice daytime functionality. And what this is is created you know thousands of little Python functions that just ran in around you know five or six seconds. Um, and so what uh, Static Frame did is it broke down these sort of high-level operations into thousands of little pandas functions that ran across all of our pandas data frames, across all the machines in our cluster, um, but that sort of holistically produced the same result that we were expecting. Uh, and the result that we find is that, uh, you know, New Yorkers tip relatively well. They're fairly generous on average, around you know, 23, 25% tip on average, uh, with an incredible spike here at 4 a.m. Uh, I guess up to around 38% on average. Uh, so this is sort of a nice, fun result. Uh, my understanding is this is the last call at the bars. Um, but so here we have sort of the nice, pleasant pandas experience, but on operating on data that's uh, larger than RAM across a cluster. So uh, this is really nice. Uh, it solves a lot of problems. Um, if you sort of have a lot of people who use pandas already and want to sort of extend that functionality out to larger data sets and have a cluster nearby, DAS data frame can be a really natural way for them to do so. Uh, it's worth pointing out that uh, Dask data frame is actually largely maintained by Pandas developers. So it's sort of half maintained by people who work at Continuum or people who are interested in Dask generally about parallel computing. Uh, and it's about half maintained by just people who care about Pandas data frames. Uh, so it's a really good co collaboration. Uh, okay, so uh, again, we had big Pandas data frames running on top of Dask. Dask was the thing that ran all of these thousands of Python functions across a cluster, figured out where to run them, moved data between different machines, you know, dealt with if a machine w went down during that period, etc. So Dask is a bit lower level, and it's not restricted to just pandas data frames. This ends up being really important. Um, if you have a lot of data frame computation, Dask data is a good fit. But so too are lots of things. You know, Spark will be great, Hadoop will be great, a big database is probably even better than any of those. Um, but many people have problem computations that don't fit nicely into a big data frame abstraction. They might have something that's a bit more complex uh, or something where it's not as sort of canned. They want to sort of get outside of just the data frame abstraction. Uh, so Dask has big collections like data frames and n-dimensional arrays and bags, which look a little bit like Spark RDDs. But Dask also has the ability just to write down arbitrary dynamic task graphs and execute those. This is more like Luigi or Airflow. So as a sort of example of that, I'm going to do with a different um, computation here. We're going to have some small functions that just sleep for a random amount of time and then do a little bit of work, you know, adding one, subtracting one, adding two numbers together. And I'm just have some really simple sequential code here. It's just normal Python. I'm going to run those here in my local notebook. It's going to take a little while. It takes, you know, two seconds. It might take a different amount of time if I ran it again. Um, and this code is, is normal Python. Um, but it is parallelizable a little bit, right? We could call the increment and the deck functions uh, at the same time in parallel if we wanted to. So we're going to use Dask to do that for us. So we're going to do that is we're going to take our normal Python functions, increment, decrement, and add, and we're going to sort of mark them with Dask delayed. And what this does is that now these functions increment, decrement, and add uh, don't compute immediately. Instead, they compute lazily, and they sort of put, they take the arguments they were given and put them into uh, a graph. So um, this runs now instantly, but didn't actually do any work. What it did instead is it created a computation for us. We're going to call it decrement on something. We're going to call it increment on something. Those are produce two results. We're going to feed both of those results into the add function and get a result back. Uh, and now what we can do is we can now run that uh, locally on our, you know, maybe I'll go with threads on our local machine, and it's going to run these two in parallel, hand both the intermediate results off to add, and add that sequentially. So this will be a little bit faster. Um, no, I didn't connect to the cluster here. This is just running on my local laptop, uh, on, I guess on the local head node of this cluster. Um, so it's just running on a single machine. Dask is really easy to get up, get up and started. By default, it just uses threads on a single machine. You can use processes on a single machine. Uh, it's really easy to get started. Uh, but after you have sort of more computation, you might want to connect to a cluster. Uh, now we can do it to that same computation. And now we're going to run, uh, you know, here we ran increment on one computer, it took 800 milliseconds. We ran decrement on another computer, it took 35 milliseconds. Uh, both of the intermediate results were communicated to a third computer, this guy, or maybe it's probably the same computer up here. Um, and then that transfer took around a millisecond and we computed add. Okay, so uh, here we're running the same code, but no longer with threads on a local machine, but across a cluster. 
Uh, so this is nice because we can now build maybe larger computations. Uh, so here we've got, you know, a bunch of, um, you know, on 256 numbers, we're computing increment, and then we're decrementing that, that value. So we're feeding the result of one delayed call into another, and that creates a link between those two computations. Uh, and then we are adding those together. And again, we're taking these same delayed results and feeding them into another delayed function. So we're building up a dependency tree, even with this sort of very normal Python code. So Dask delayed is a great way to parallelize existing code bases. Uh, it's fairly easy to, in the span of a few hours, find the computational intense part of your program, throw in some delayed decorators in there, and then uh, have it be able to run in a cluster and saturate that machine fairly well. So, um, yeah. so this is sort of again a great way to take existing normal Python code. You need to learn. You don't. You don't need to learn a whole new API. It's pretty straightforward, uh, and you can build complex things. Uh, so, for example, let's imagine that we wanted to uh, add together all of these 206 numbers that are on the cluster now, uh, but not add them together by sending them all to one machine and adding, but by adding them pairwise. So we might take uh, every pair of numbers and just add them together. Uh, so now we have maybe half as many numbers uh, on the same machines. And we'll take all of those numbers and add them together. So we have a quarter as many numbers. And we're going to keep doing that until we have only one number left. This is called a, a tree reduction or a tree summation. And here's some relatively sort of straightforward Python code. You know, it should take you sort of a minute to understand this, so it's not trivial, but it's also not super complex. Sort of anyone with moderate Python ability can read and understand and reproduce this code. Um, and here we're going to visualize the graph. The visualization is going to take a little, little bit. And what we're going to see is that this sort of normal Python code, you know, we're taking neighboring integers in this list, or neighbor, neighboring delayed values in this list, adding them together. Uh, and that produces, you know, this tree graph um, that, you know, is actually relatively similar to what we're, we sort of envisioned up here. So Dask allows you to write down your own algorithms with normal Python code, and that's really the, the main selling point here. Uh, so let's go ahead and compute that, and we can sort of then run that on a cluster. And you're seeing lots of little red bars as communicating. You're also seeing it's pretty uh, busy at the beginning of the computation, but then over time, as you sort of get uh, closer to the top of that tree, which has fewer and fewer branches, uh, there's less and less parallelism to go around. So you can almost see the tree structure sort of recreated here. So again, this is an example where um, you may work in a company that has a lot of parallel computing, definitely, but that parallel computing isn't as straightforward as just map this function across lots of data, or it might not be just SQL kind of computations, it might not be a data frame. You may have something that's, that's more complex, uh, but is still easily parallelizable. And Dask delayed can run top of the Dask scheduler and can maybe handle a lot of that parallelism. Uh, so at this point, people often ask questions like, you know, great, this is great, how do I get it set up? How do I reproduce these same examples internally? Again, these examples are on the Dask EC2 project, um, which will start up a cluster on Amazon's EC2 system. Uh, inside of your own company, you may ask, like, hey, does this run on Yarn? Does it run on Mesos? Does it run on my job scheduler, like SGE or Slurm? And the answer is that, yes, there's a variety of projects that handle all of those things. Uh, but uh, it's useful to know how to set up Dask just on your own. So I'm now going to, on my local laptop here, uh, start up Dask. And so you can pip install Dask, or you can conda install Dask. You might also want to add the distributed package, which will give you the distributed scheduler. And when you do that, um, that will then give you two, uh, two executables that you can run on your computer. One is Dask scheduler. That's a program that needs to run on one computer on your machine. Uh, the other is Dask Worker, which needs the address of wherever the scheduler is living. So we might, on one machine, uh, run a scheduler, and on a bunch of other machines, we're going to run Dask Workers. Those workers will connect up to the scheduler, and you know they'll sort of be, become aware of each other. Uh, and then, And then from any Python environment, this could be a script, it could be a notebook, it could be some you know, IT process, uh, we can connect to that uh, cluster uh, by just giving the same address. Whoops. And you see that we've connected to this, this cluster. There are two processes. Each process has four cores. So that's, that's these guys. Um, 
Uh, you can start and stop these workers, you know, as you like. You can scale them up, you can scale them down. If they go down in, between in, in the middle of a computation, Dask will figure it out and will recompute things. Um, generally speaking, uh, this is easy to set up and it does most of the things you want it to in a cluster environment. Um, okay, so that's uh, normally what conversations look like. Uh, and if there is more information than necessary, uh, you can go to dask.pyta.org. Or the distributed scheduler has a separate piece of documentation at distributed.readthedocs.org. So this tends to be some more for users who are interested in Dask data frame, this web page on the left. The page on the right tends to be more for sort of more technical people who are interested in, say, how does Dask handle resiliency, or how do you move messages back and forth, or you know, what's the policy for something or other. Um, and that's it. Uh, thank you all for your time.